Good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our Northern Light Health Business to Business Zoom conference. We find ourselves in the midst of more people getting the coronavirus in Maine. The dreaded surge has arrived. More people are being hospitalized and taxing our frontline healthcare workers. More people are dying. We're hearing about treatment options and we're rolling out vaccines across the nation, all during the holiday season. It truly is reality that's stranger than fiction. Today, we are in for a real treat. We have three physician experts that will share their knowledge with us. We'll be talking about the state of the pandemic, treatments, vaccines, and in fact, all things COVID-19. Everything is fair game. I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephen Sears, our special guest. Dr. Sears is an epidemiologist and clinical advisor at Maine CDC. His specialty is infectious diseases. Stephen, your updates for clinicians are my favorite source for learning cutting edge clinical information. Thank you for translating the complex science into useful information. Next, I am delighted to welcome back Dr. Rebecca Gass an infectious disease specialist at Northern Light Easton Maine Medical Center. Rebecca, I appreciate the wealth of insight you provide to our leadership team. I always know I can count on the information you share with us. Thank you for joining us today. Last and certainly not least is Dr. Jim Jarvis, the Medical Director of Clinical Education at Northern Light Easton Maine Medical Center and our COVID-19 Incident Command Operations Section Chief at Northern Light Health. Many of you are familiar with Dr. Jarvis, not only from this series, but his appearances on the evening news sharing up-to-date information on COVID-19. Thank you for your ongoing commitment, Jim. I am Dr. Ed Gilkey, Senior Physician Executive at Northern Light Beacon Health, and I will be your moderator for the next hour. I will be asking our experts questions, seeking out the information you are interested in. Before we get started, I will read our legal disclosure. The coronavirus pandemic is an ongoing, continuously evolving situation. Northern Light Health encourages everyone to follow federal and state governmental guidance and mandates. Northern Light Health does not know the particulars of your situation, so the information presented today is general in nature and is based upon Northern Light Health's own experience, which may or may not apply in your specific situation and which may be revised as we learn more about the coronavirus. Accordingly, following any guidance Northern Light Health presents today in no way guarantees that you, your employees, and or your customers and clients will not contract or spread the coronavirus. A reminder, this hour is for you. Please use the chat function to ask your questions. I'll keep track of your questions and have our speakers respond. Also, I hope each of you will take a few minutes immediately following our hour to answer our quick five question survey. Your input directly affects our topics and helps guide our future conferences. Let's get started. We've all been on a steep learning curve this year. What is one critical thing you have learned about the coronavirus that is important to share with our audience? We'll start with Dr. Jarvis. Thank you, Ed. Um, I think for me, uh, as I think about it, um, it really is how smart this virus is. And, I, and when I say smart, that's in quotations. It doesn't have the ability to think or reason or anything like that, but it is incredibly efficient at doing its job. And its job is solely to infect individuals, spread it throughout and make more copies of itself. Um, as we've gone through this pandemic, we found, find that it always finds a way to beat us. Uh, it crosses borders of states, countries, uh, doesn't care about political affiliations, says, race, sex, gender, or age. Um, it will infect you if you come in contact with it. Uh, and that becomes the challenge for us. Uh, we continue to hear people who, who state that they don't think that this is anything that to worry about. It is something to worry about. This virus is very good at what it is doing. And unfortunately, it is causing harm in ways that we have never seen before, particularly from a respiratory born virus. So for me, the lesson I learned is these things are smart and we need to be ready for them. So sort of brilliant in its simplicity. It does its work really well. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Dr. Gass, uh, what's that one critical thing uh, you've learned that you'd like to share? Well, it's been nine months of learning. 
Um, mm -hmm. I think <laughs> the major thing that I've learned is that infection with this virus can be devastating. And also the treatment options that we have and what we can do to um, keep people alive has improved over the course mm. of the last nine months. Um, we really don't have a lot of tools in our chest to do that. The best tool we have are the simple public health tools that keep us from getting infected. And that's the best way to fight this virus is to protect ourselves and each other by following simple public health guidelines like face coverings, hand washings, uh, avoiding um, being in close contact and gatherings. And then now hopefully with the vaccine, uh, we'll have another tool in our chest to fight this virus. So it sounds like back to basics, as boring as that is, it's critically important here. Thank you. Dr. Sears, what's your take on that one critical thing you wanna make sure we all know? Well, Dr. Jarvis called it smart. I call it sneaky. Um, it's a very <laughs> sneaky virus and it just, and I, what do I mean by that? It's able to get around through and to populations all over everywhere. And so we, what we've seen is sort of an inexorable um, increasing of cases over the last three or four months um, for a lot of reasons. But what I, when I'm working up an outbreak, I find that just when we thought we'd done everything we were supposed to, there probably was something that we did not um, put into place. And so it sneaks in. And you know, when I say put into place, then the things that we want to do, I just repeat what Dr. Gass said, using, you know, using uh, distancing, face coverings, um, hand washing, things that really you know, they make sense, but we just seem to not be able to put into place as effectively as we could. Mm, thank you. So I'm going to uh, uh, build off of what Dr. Gass says. We've been immersed in the coronavirus pandemic for nine months. Uh, Dr. Sears, I'll go back to you. Uh, what three pearls would you like to share with our audience that you've learned about this virus clinically? Um, clinically, um, <clears throat> I think I'd sort of make it more than what I've learned. We've learned in the, in the um, medical field how to treat it a lot better than we used to. If we go back to like April or May, um, there were really awful and terrible stories about people being put on ventilators and having very poor outcomes. We have improved dramatically since then. Is it perfect? No, we still, you know, as we sit here today, there are 17 people in Maine's ICUs on ventilators right now, but that's a lot less than it would have been in April for the number of cases we have. Mm -hmm. Number two, I think that um, we continue to evolve. It, the virus continues to evolve in many ways, um, but we continue to find new ways to develop treatments and therapies. And I'm very impressed with um, the scientific breakthroughs that um, have occurred. Um, do we have the cure? No, but we at least have something to, to work on. And the third, I think, is what we've heard a lot in the last couple of weeks is that we have moved very rapidly, but very efficiently and scientifically accurately to develop a vaccine and begin to get that out. And the vaccine's not gonna be the thing that gets us totally out of this um, in the short term. We still need to do the, the uh, distancing, masking and uh, hand washing because it's gonna take a while to get everybody vaccinated. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sears. Dr. Gass, let's kind of build on the vaccines. We know they're front and center. They're kind of in the news completely. A lot of activity. Um, all of us on this call are really um, working a lot with the vaccines. Can you provide uh, three appetizers that you'd like to share about vaccines? Okay. Um, I would say that first off is that Vaccine development, although it's come along quickly, has not been a rush job scientifically. Mm -hmm. I mean, this vaccine is being based on work that's been done with coronaviruses for a long time. Vaccine development was started back in 2003 with the first SARS outbreak. And we've had great advances in vaccine platform technology. So this really isn't a rush job. Uh, number two is I think these vaccines, based on the data, they're safe, but there will be reactions to them. We will have sore arms. We will have some other symptoms. What this means is the vaccine is working and your immune system is responding to it as it should. 
And then I'll just reiterate what Dr. Sears said, and I'm sure you'll hear this over and over and over again today, is the day you get your vaccine or the second dose of vaccine is not the day you take off your mask. We still need to keep up with masking, hand washing, and social distancing. Mm. Yeah, I, I think um, we're all going to speak to that quite a bit uh, uh, during this hour, for sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gass. Dr. Jarvis, uh, testing is still a moving target. What three facts do you want everyone to know? Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, the first fact is, is that we need to test appropriately. And what I mean by that is that there are certain tests for certain situations. And we need to follow those guidance and guidelines. Um, I'm a little bit concerned as we hear the good news that uh, there will be better, uh, more accurate, rapid testing available to us. But most of those tests are for people who are symptomatic. And my fear is, is that people will get those tests when they're asymptomatic for things like travel or wanting to go to grandma's house for Christmas. Think, think that a negative result there is their, quote, get out of jail free card so they can go and travel. Um, and that is not the case. We know that these tests are not accurate uh, or as accurate when we're talking about people without symptoms. And so it's just a, a, a really a snapshot in time. It's quite possible that your test is negative today. Three days later, your test comes back positive. And in that meantime, you have now spread virus to other individuals, particularly the ones that you love and the communities that we care so much about. So that's one. Two, we need to be patient. Those those tests that we have called the PCR tests, which is our gold standard or our most important test that we are using clinically, um, they take time for us to run. Because we are now seeing the increase in number of cases across the state, we are also seeing an, an appropriate increase in the number of people being tested. Well, that means that, that backlogs our labs, including the labs here in the state, and labs that we send these tests off to outside of our state. So be patient. You won't get your results back in 15 minutes it may be a day, it may be two days, it may be a week, and just be patient. We are prioritizing those clinical situations and that's the last point that I wanna make. People who need the test so that we can treat them clinically, they're getting those tests and they're getting their results back in a timely fashion so we can do that appropriately. When we're doing testing for things like travel, it's gonna take time. So, so I think I probably speak for a lot of people by saying, boy, wouldn't it be nice if we could just test everyone every day and really know what's going on? And unfortunately, the clinical aspects of testing do not work that way. So there is a reason that that's not what's happening. Um, I thought at this point I would share a, a couple of slides with data. I think everybody says, show me the data, then I can make some decisions. So let's start with a, a couple of slides here. Um, and then what I pulled this from was uh, um, covidtracking.com. And anyone can go into that site and it's very interactive. I happen to personally like the graphics on this because it does a good job of really showing it in colors, et cetera. Um, but you can, you can actually uh, work with this data and um, ask questions of it, so to speak. These I pulled off on December 12th. They, they focus on the range from April 1st to December 12th. This is a national uh, picture. And in the first column in the uh, lavender is daily tests. I'll draw your attention to the bold line in there. That's the seven day um, average line. So it's a great way to trend and really understand what the perhaps noise of the daily uh, results are. So we could see testing really has uh, gone through the roof across the country. In a like manner, the daily cases, uh, we had a bump uh, that uh, occurred in the early summer, and then now we really see it taking off. And that's, that's what we hear on the, the nightly news uh, over the last, oh, probably six, eight weeks. And then looking at the currently hospitalized, we've had a couple of bumps, and now we're into a third bump that looks like it's going really uh, astronomical, if you will. Um, and this is what we're hearing in the nightly news now, how parts of the country, their ICUs are overtaxed, um, the staffing is an issue, so that's where that plays in. And then of course we see the daily um, deaths. And I think over the summer as the deaths fall, uh, fell off of that peak of uh, over 2,000 per day um, in the early um, part of the spring, 
that's where people let down their guard and started to do their summer activities and people became complacent. And, you know, we were sort of deciding on masks more on our political view of the world than our clinical view of the world, if you will. Um, and now we see that the deaths are uh, coming up here. If you go to the next slide, another way of looking at this, um, this is sort of a stylized uh, map of the uh, country. But I draw your attention to, uh, this is change in seven day average cases and Maine uh, is at 35% you know, week over week, which is um, not favorable at all. It puts us into the, uh, the rising group to the far right there. Um, and so let's go to the next slide and drill down a bit more to, um, to Maine and looking at uh, hospitalizations in Maine are increasing by 11%. So we're in that rising column again. So I think these draw our attention to the fact that while we've paid attention to all the rising cases and hospitalizations across the country, it does seem to be our turn. And the final slide uh, next will be uh, similar to that first slide, uh, but it's main specific. And you can see uh, the noise of the daily uh, results uh, better on this one. Um, and therefore, the bold lines are really important. You see the daily cases really spiking, the hospitalizations in Maine uh, spiking. You know, we've been watching uh, going from uh, 60 people hospitalized we're up above 180 people hospitalized at this point. You know, it really has been developing. And with that, we do see some deaths increasing, uh, you, you know, because of the volumes. So with all of that data as our background, uh, Dr. Sears, I I'll ask you a couple of questions to get us started on this. You know, the number of positive cases, hospitalizations, and deaths are accelerating in Maine, just like across the rest of the country that we saw previously. What's going on that's causing this? Really good question. And so let me try to frame that um, around three aspects. The first um, is that weather's gotten cold, and I'm going to come back to that. Second is because the weather's cold, we've gone indoors, um, and so that we have more opportunity to be um, closer to people who might be infected. And third is we probably have not done as good a job in doing those basic protections that we talked about, such as wearing the mask and um, trying to keep at least six feet away from, from people. Um, we know that when people go indoors and have those associations, um, that the likelihood of, of encountering somebody with the virus increases. There have been a number of outbreaks that have been associated with restaurants, bars, um, indoor venues, any group, anytime we get groups together, um, the literature is filled with that. So that's, that's number one, is we, we ourselves behaviorally have not done what we should. Let's go back to it's winter, it's cold. There's probably a few things that are important to note. The virus and all respiratory viruses better when it's cold and it's not just because it's cold it's because the humidity is down um, and what that does for the virus when somebody exhales it is it means that the droplets that we know that people have coming out of their mouth stay in the air longer so you have what's called a, <clears throat> a little longer aerosolization and when that happens then that means the potential for increasing infection um, is uh, is there. And then if you put that together with people not using the protections they should, you can easily see how those two things come together to do that. There's also been some talk about maybe the virus is a little different than it used to be. Um, we know that the virus does change as most viruses. And it does seem that the virus that's been around more recently is probably a little more transmissible than the one that we maybe saw six months ago. Not a great deal. Um, but if you take that and you say the virus may be a little more transmissible, we're not doing the things that we can to protect ourselves. And then you throw in that factor of we're indoors in more enclosed spaces in older, less humid uh, environments that favor the virus staying aerosolized. Um, those factors are probably some of the major ones that are causing us to see all this increase. Mm. 
Great. Thank you. You know, um, thinking through this a little bit more, um, what can we do to improve the situation? And we'll, you know, we'll keep in mind that um, the holidays are really upon us. So, uh, you know, Dr. Sears, what do you think we can do? I mean, I, I guess we can't mention masks and, uh, you know, physical distancing and hand washing enough. We really can't because that's the bread and butter of what we need to, to do. Um, but your thoughts and with the holidays upon us? I think, you know, first is to, to recognize that even though they may be your friends um, or your family um, that are coming from away, they might have different um, potential exposures. And we need to, to be aware of that. We know after Thanksgiving, we started to see a significant increase. And some, uh, I should have mentioned, some of the increase we're seeing now is likely due to the post-Thanksgiving mm. um, increase in trans transmission. So we have to be concerned about the same phenomena with Christmas because people do like to get together. Um, but I think we need to try to think about the holidays in a different way. Hopefully, if everything goes well with vaccine, we are, this will be the last Christmas that we have to spend in, kind of, in a more isolated way than we've ever done in the past. But the more you can minimize the number of people and, not, and try not to go to group gatherings, there's, there's a great desire to go caroling or to go to um, services. Um, all of those are increasing the number of potential contacts. So it's, you know, it's lots of reasons that happen around the holidays. Um, you know, I think this, the second, and I, I know you said we can't emphasize it too much, um, but face coverings have been shown to be effective to decrease um, someone um, sort of exhaling virus. It's also protective for you. So they've got, they serve a couple of purposes um, mm -hmm. overall. And we just, you know, it, it's, it really are, it really is those simple sorts of things um, that we can do. Mm, thank you. Well, I'll, I'll share with everyone um, this Saturday coming. So the Saturday before Christmas is the big event in uh, our family. And uh, typically we have 25 of us get together. We do a Yankee swap. Uh, you know, we engage the kids and all that. And what a blast, particularly for my in-laws who are 87 and 88. Um, we're not doing that this year. We're going to FaceTime, Zoom, all sorts of creative ways of doing it, but we're not doing that this year. So um, I have a question from our audience uh, I'd like to raise. Um, and it's about uh, metrics that panelists could use in making decisions about curtailing public services. So in this particular instance, it's a public library. And should we close the building uh, or should we have um, public shift to curbside pickup only? What are the metrics we should be looking at? You know, what, what's your thoughts on that, Dr. Gass? You're on mute. Okay. I think that probably uh, Dr. Sears would be better able okay, to answer that fine. question in terms of metrics. So I'll defer to him. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Sears, what's your take on that? You know, in terms sure. of making decisions from a public uh, point of view. I think number one is take a look at the number of people in a space at any one time, and. If we go back to the early spring, we remember that we actually tried to keep gatherings down to sizes of 10. Um, I know that right now there are there is um, the ability to have um, gatherings um, larger than that, but I think that's a pretty good number. And if 10, and again, that depends a little bit on the, the space you're in. Um, if you're in the Civic Center and had 10 people, that's different than 10 people in the public library. Um, but if you keep the number of people down, which means that you control the flow of individuals, that you um, make it mandatory that as people come in that they have to have face coverings on. And I know that um, the governor has um, recently um, increased the, um, um, the executive order to do just that. Um, if you do those two things, um, there, isn't one, um, there isn't one other metric to really say, oh, we are at that point. Um, the only time that that would happen, it would be if every if everything had to shut down. And we did that in the spring because the rates were um, so, um, 
they were so they were accelerating at such a rate without any real good understanding of where that might go. Are we going to get there again? I don't think so. Um, but I think that if we do those kind of take a look at how many people are coming together, keep that to a, a low number, keep people from from um, congregating together when they're together in a space, keep them again distance. You you can still get a lot of the things done that we'd like to do. Uh, and I, I think I, I want to emphasize we're not you know sometimes the CDC is you know um, we're um, blame for uh, being the Grinch in Christmas or, you know, taking away um, Halloween fun or whatever. It's, there are ways to do this safely. And I know that uh, Dr. Gilkey just said that using Zoom or other platforms, FaceTime, ways to, to get together without necessarily be, being together physically. Um, I think that I've been absolutely impressed by how creative people are to find mm -hmm. these sorts of solutions. Um, but I wish I could give you one number and say, here it is, this is the rate um, at which the numbers in your community are going um, too far. Um, and the, but unfortunately it isn't, it's a, it's a graded um, sort of increase. Um, and so with that, we generally try to decrease those um, events where people are coming more together than they might, um, might be able to do safely. Yeah, thank you. You know, one of the things I think about with that is um, if you wanted zero risk of getting the coronavirus, you stay home and you have no contact whatsoever with the outside world. And that's the closest you could get to zero risk. Everything you choose to do beyond that increases the risk. And each of us have to determine how does that risk get determined? So if we're in a, an open area, where people don't have masks and they're walking past us at three feet away, that risk may be different than if everybody was masks and six feet away. So we have to process through that and understand what risk taking is about. Um, I'm gonna dig down a little bit deeper into uh, the importance of paying attention, Dr. Gass. And some of the stuff that y you and I and, and others have come across are things like, if we think back to the spring, the number of cases uh, where people had coronavirus in Maine was really quite small. And the concept there is called prevalence. So the prevalence of the disease was really quite low. And, you know, we were all very cautious because we didn't understand things. And then as we became more comfortable understanding that there are treatments available, a vaccine's coming, we did see over the summer people really loosen up uh, quite a bit. And now going into the fall and now winter, we see the prevalence increasing. And I'm hearing concepts like we've moved from outbreaks to community transmission. And then one of your colleagues, Dr. Gass, just yesterday said, uh, we see uncontrolled community transmission in Maine. And that ties into some of the numbers that I shared with everyone on the slides previously. So we're in a different situation this fall winter than we were uh, in the spring. And could you help us to get a perspective from an infectious disease point of view? What, how big a deal is this virus? You know, how, how much effort should we all be putting into avoiding getting it? Um, I think it is a big deal to get this virus. Also, the majority of people who are infected with SARS-CoV-2 will be asymptomatic in that same setting they have the ability to spread to people who are at risk for getting severe disease and ending up in the hospital um, with acute complications at high risk for death. So the elderly amongst us, people who are overweight, people who have underlying health problems like diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, and liver disease. So even though you yourself may carry on and have no symptoms, you have to worry about the people around you and spreading it. The other concern, and, and a major concern with that is overwhelming our hospital systems. We've seen a huge surge um, in admissions to hospital. 
um, for coronavirus alone, but we still have to take care of the other people who are in our community. Um, we still have to take care of the traumas that come in, the heart attacks, and our staff um, is, is being uh, overwhelmed in, in hospitals across the state and across the country with the burden of work. Um, there are issues about hospital capacity that we have to consider. So every little bit that the individual can do to keep themselves safe and their community safe and not overburden the healthcare system is incredibly important this winter. Um, and then finally, there's this concept of, I don't like the term, the long hauler syndrome. And there's something going on with this virus that we're still learning about that after infection, there are still long-term health consequences that have yet to be defined. And it's not only from the people who are critically ill and in the hospital and in the intensive care units for long periods of time and then have a very long recovery and all the post-infection complications, but we're also seeing it in people with milder disease. And I think one group that's of particular concern is young people mm -hmm. um, because they are driving or have been driving a lot of the spread in the communities and universities. And we're seeing some um, uh, chronic fatigue, long haulers type syndrome in those, those kids who really weren't sick in the first place, and even some significant um, concerning signs about long-term cardiac problems in these people. So, so this is a big deal uh, uh, in many ways. I think all of us would agree, uh, you know, avoiding getting the virus is very helpful for any individual as well as for our population as a whole. So uh, thank you. I'm going to actually go down the pathway of um, those people that are described as long haulers or people who have um, residual symptoms after they've recovered from the acute COVID and, in fact, didn't require hospitalization. Uh, so, Dr. Sears, I'll, I'll actually ask you about this um, uh, piece. Uh, there, was a, there was a segment on 60 Minutes for our audience to take a look at uh, on November 22nd. It's about a 15-minute segment that really addressed this and drew my attention to it. Um, in New York, the Mount Sinai uh, School of Medicine is running a post-COVID uh, clinic, and they're seeing thousands of people with these uh, residual symptoms. Some are you know, young people in the ages of 20 to 40 who may have been previously a marathon runner and at this point are struggling to keep their balance. So could you help us to understand a little bit more about what we're beginning to see? And I know it's very early in the process uh, with the amount of history we have. Sure, um, and you're, you're right, it is early, uh, but there are a number of centers around the country that are, are trying to study this and to get a better handle. And, you know, like, for instance, what, what percent of people who have COVID have chronic symptoms? I think, number one, almost everybody is not feeling well two weeks out. A good number of people are not feeling well six weeks out. Um, and then there's a, this subsection of the individuals who, aren't feel, who don't feel well for months at a time, and I think that's really what was on 60 Minutes, the, there's sort of two things to say about that. One is the people who are severely ill who are in the hospital tend to take a long time to recover. That's, in a sense, almost something different than this other syndrome, which is a it's best described as both chronic fatigue as well as sometimes some chronic um, mental sort of mental cognition issues and the people describe what's called a brain fog. Um, they just don't think as clearly and it takes them a long time. We do, I, I think it's important mm -hmm. to sort of um, emphasize about this virus is we only have 10 months now of experience. Mm -hmm. So some of these, um, some of these conditions, we are really learning as we go. But having said that, we know that the virus can actually spread to all body systems. There's, um, mm -hmm. It is clear that we think of it as a pulmonary disease, but it can get into the blood, it can spread to the central nervous system, it can, it's cause, it can cause problems in the heart. In fact, some young athletes have had myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart. But we don't really yet know exactly what the percentage of that is. Of that, chronic condition is. I 
talked with um, individuals, uh, sort of the, the leaders at each one of the medical centers to see what was happening. And most, most of the people who have this right now in Maine are still going back to their primary care physicians. We don't have any clinics that are centralized for that. Um, is it a problem? Yes. How, com how common is it? I don't know. I think it's always important to, to recognize in a place like New York, and again, I'm not picking on New York, they just had a tremendously large number of cases in the spring. So um, even if there were 1% of the patients they had who had this, mm. that would be a large number. So mm. the as best I can tell from the studies and the literature, it's probably about 4 to 5%. Um, of people go on at least for several months. Um, and then the question is, how much longer? Probably, again, you ask why, probably because the virus can be really um, way more, um, it spreads way farther than what we thought was just a respiratory virus, and it does affect all organ systems. So our takeaway here is um, this coronavirus is very significant, um, and it's very significant for every individual to avoid getting it, no matter what their age, for a host of reasons that uh, um, our experts have shared with us today. I'm going to switch gears, and we're going to engage our audience in a poll. We're going to talk a bit about the vaccines, because that's the hot item of, uh, of the last week. So. Will you encourage your employees to get a COVID-19 vaccine? And we've given you a couple of choices here, a uh, couple of yeses and a couple of noes, and think through and uh, we'll compare notes here. Okay, so uh, 10 second warning. <laughs> okay, so we'll just end it. I see that we're, we're stabilized at 61. So I'll end the polling here and uh, we could see that for our group, uh, it's pretty heavily weighted to uh, the yeses. Um, and then there is, um, you know, some concerns at the no level and we will address some of those concerns in our discussion. So that's great. So what I will also share is, let me move this out of the way. Um, Maine Biz did this uh, with a group of their clientele. And um, interestingly, it looks fairly similar. So I think our um, audience today is very consistent with the population that Maine Biz uh, shared. So there's a lot of motivation to take the, uh, the vaccine. As a matter of fact, I'll just pull out groups and I'll put my nickel down. Uh, when my turn comes, I will take the vaccine. How about you, Dr. Jarvis? Uh, I'm, I most assuredly will. Uh, I was asked today why I have not gotten my vaccine, and uh, right now I'm not in a clinical role, so I haven't mm -hmm. been a frontline worker, um, and uh, I will wait my turn, but when my turn comes up, I will be there enthusiastically. And Dr. Sears? Absolutely, and I would recommend it for my family, <clears throat> as I get questions almost every day from one of my extended family from all around the country, like, should we take it? Um, you know, is it safe? I think that um, Dr. Gass addressed this. Although this um, was created in a very um, accelerated time frame, it is extremely safe. And I, I feel very comfortable with it. Again, I haven't taken it because I am not taking care of patients directly. And that's the first grouping that we're trying to get vaccinated. And Dr. Gass. Will you take it when you're, well, you're actually in a different group than the three of us, I think. So I actually have direct patient care. Um, and so I am getting my vaccine tomorrow. Um, I was offered it yesterday, um, but I'm on service. And uh, there are some reactions to the vaccine. And I wanted to make sure that I took it 
when I was going off my uh, my work uh, week. So I'm booked for tomorrow at noon. Okay. Well, you're really putting your nickel down. That's perfect. You know, I want, Dr. I, 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 Ed, I just want to add, you know, yeah, you know Stephen shared about his family. So for myself, I have, I have one daughter who's a frontline worker and I can't wait till she gets hers. And I have another daughter that's a cancer survivor and I can't wait till she gets hers. Um, uh, it becomes personal when you start thinking about it in those terms. And just like we've talked about, uh, wearing the face covering is not always about you. It's about others. Uh, vaccination is the same way. Um, you know, we will protect each other when we all get the vaccine. And so that's a key point that we need to that we need to emphasize. Mm. You know, I'll make a mention, uh, something I picked up from Dr. Shah about a week and a half ago. He helped us to understand that the vaccine is part of the approach to managing the pandemic. And if you think about what you're trying to do for a pandemic to go away, uh, a lot of us have heard about the concept called r naught. r naught is a numerical way of expressing the transmissibility of an infectious disease. And in this case, well, in all cases, if the r naught is greater than one, the pandemic continues. To end the pandemic, we need to be below one. So that means every person, if they give it to one other person, that's an R naught of one. Now, this virus is actually higher than uh, uh, 1.0. So that's why it's really kind of spreading uh, so easily. So part of the game plan is what we've been talking about, the basics. Let's stop the spreading, fa facial coverings, masks, social distancing, hand washing, um, avoiding close contacts, choosing to celebrate with household uh, members only, not extended family. Those are the things we can do to start driving that are not uh, closer to below one. But then the vaccine comes in and the vaccine is not immediately going to change us into a non-pandemic mode. It's going to actually take several months for the vaccine to take effect. And what we're trying to do is build up the number of people who now are immune to it and therefore won't be spreading it, along with those people who have some amount of immunity that we're not quite clear about uh, for having had uh, gotten the COVID-19 uh, virus. And over time, as we build up, we're going to be able to see the pandemic change. So, Dr. Gass, would you, would you mind talking a little bit about building up that herd immunity concept? Okay, so, so herd immunity um, is a concept whereby in a population, enough people have protective immunity against a germ and an infection um, either naturally by getting infected or by having a vaccine that effectively the disease can't be transmitted in that community any longer. Um, and again, that depends on a lot of things. It depends on the immune response either to natural infection um, or to the vaccine. It depends on the rates of transmission and uh, the r not in the community. Um, and a vaccine is one tool that we can use in that. I would just give one caveat is that we don't really have a good answer as to what herd immunity is going to look like for COVID-19 because we don't fully understand the immune response to it and how long it lasts. And there's one big question with the vaccines, although hopefully it'll get answered soon, is that we know that the vaccines at least the Pfizer vaccine, which is, was approved last week, and the Moderna vaccine, which is going in front of the FDA today, we know that they prevent symptomatic disease and severe disease. What we don't know is whether they prevent infection. So it's still possible that you could become infected with the virus and be asymptomatic because we know the vaccines keep you from getting sick. And there's a possibility that you could still transmit disease. Now, Moderna, we, we don't have the answer to that. Moderna um, has some preliminary data that says maybe they do have some protective um, efficacy against infection. But that's one gap in our knowledge. I would say that 
people with a lot more expertise than I have in terms of vaccinology are hopeful that because these vaccines are just so effective overall in preventing disease, that they will be able to prevent infection. But that's a big unknown in our development of herd immunity. Mm -hmm. So, so really important concept. So, so we'll probably be uh, dealing with the back to basics we keep talking about for uh, quite a bit longer, right? Um, yes. You know, if if I can ask you to project, what do you think next summer is going to look like? Oh, I wish I had a crystal ball. <laughs> we um, all do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am hopeful. I'm optimistic mm -hmm. that hopefully we will be heading towards some semblance of normalcy. Part of it depends on the final data on these vaccines and the concepts I just talked about. It depends on how much uptake there is in the community. Um, it depends on how fast the vaccines roll out. So probably vaccine won't be available to the general public until some people would say March, April, there are always hiccups. So I'm thinking it might be May, June till it's widely available to the general public. So that's going to be one thing. The other good thing about the summer is it's the time when we can move outdoors, mm -hmm. at least in places like Maine. And so I think that will be helpful. I suspect we'll still be wearing masks. Um, and probably doing some social distancing. I'm a little more hopeful that by the fall, when we're thinking about going back indoors, that maybe next fall will look a little bit more normal than this past fall, like it did for, for my kids being seniors in high schools and freshmen in university. So there's some amount of light at the end of the tunnel. We just don't know how much yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Dr. Sears, I have a, a question for you. Um, um, Home care workers are frontline workers, but yet they are not considered frontline by the state. How long before we will be able to get our home care workers the vaccination? The, the way the vaccine is being rolled out is through um, phases or tiers um, in tier one, two, and three. And tier one is then broken down into three, 1A, 1B, 1C. All primary healthcare workers who have face-to-face -face contact with patients are going to be vaccinated in Tier 1A. The first part of 1A, which is where we are right now, is to the hospitals who are caring for acutely ill COVID individuals. So it's the emergency room, the ICUs, the uh, COVID wards, the infectious disease doctors like Dr. Gass. Um, they're their primary, um, and so the the, health, the home health workers are going to be coming along, but it's just probably a, more like three or four weeks from now. And, and I say that because I don't, I can't put an exact week time on it because we're dependent upon the number of vaccines we get from the um, distribution from the federal government, and that is. Um, we have good projections, but we never know exactly um, where we are. We know, um, I can say right now, we did, we vaccinated 989 people in the state yesterday for the first day, which I thought is really actually pretty good. Um, and so we'll see this continue to accelerate upwards. Um, it's all dependent upon, I think, as uh, Dr. Gass said, the hiccups. Um, do we get all the vaccine in the time frame that we wanted it, that we thought we were going to have it? But the plan in 1A is to vaccinate all healthcare workers as well as all long term care residents um, in nursing homes and skilled facilities because we know that those individuals are the ones who are really um, at the highest risk for um, significant disease and mortality. Mm, thank you, Dr. Sears. Uh, Dr. Jarvis, I'm going to come back uh, with another vaccine uh, question, but but I have a question for Dr. S Dr. Sears um, from one of our uh, audience participants. Um, as a restaurant owner, do you see guidelines staying the same throughout next summer? Social distancing, listed seating, et cetera. Um. I'm going to, my crystal ball is as cloudy as Dr. Gass's, but I think that if we are able to distribute and vaccinate um, vaccine to significant, when what's significant, probably 75% of the population, if not more, 
um, then I think we will probably start to see a lifting of all of those guidelines. And, you know, it's a little it's a little challenging to answer that because we know that in the summer, um, restaurants can move outside a lot more um, easily than they do now. And I, and I understand the challenges of restaurants now. But I would see a lot of those guidelines beginning to ease up. They won't all go away because I think we're going to have to sort of walk gingerly towards a totally opening of everything to make sure that um, a we've got enough people vaccinated b it's it's maintaining long-term immunity um, and that we're getting the results um, but i'm i am hopeful i'm hopeful that um, clearly by the end of the summer if we've gotten to uh, enough people vaccinated and the vaccine has a um, long duration which we're hoping it does then we'll start seeing everything normalizing. Great, thank you. Um, and I, I apologize to our uh, participant. I said listing instead of limited seating, but I don't think it changes your answer at all. So uh, <laughs> I get a buy on that one. Yeah, um, no, I and mean, restaurants are at a, at a at, uh, yeah. much less capacity than they've been. Yeah, yeah, and and that's certainly a vulnerable part of our uh, you know business owners for sure. Um, um, Dr. Jarvis, l let me ask you another question related to vaccines. So you think about the elderly uh, receiving a flu vaccine. Let's say they haven't received the flu vaccine yet. Could they get their flu vaccine and COVID vaccine at the same time? Is that a wise move that way? That's a good question. So first and foremost, I would say just get your flu shot now. We are in the midst now, of flu today. season. <laughs> we, we are in the midst of flu season. Um, we have been thankful that it has been mild, but that can change at any moment. Uh, there are usually two circulating strains of flu, one flu influenza A and one influenza B. And in Maine, statistically, uh, we have influenza B hit us later on in the season. We can't afford to have that happen. We need to keep that under control. So please, 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 if you haven't gotten your flu shot yet, uh, please do so. Um, as far as getting them at the same time right now, because every because the COVID vaccine is new, um, the recommendation is that you have no other vaccines 14 days before you get your, your COVID vaccine and 14 days after. So there's that one month window. So, so that's a real reason why you need to go and get your flu shot now, because you don't want to exclude yourself from getting the COVID vaccine when it's your turn, uh, just because you got your flu shot. So that's what we know now. There are some of the, in, the COVID vaccines that are being that are in development and study right now that may actually be designed to be given with a flu shot, but we are still months, if not years, away from that happening. Great, thank you, um, Dr. Sears. Um, if you can make your best guess using your cloudy crystal ball again, um, when do you think educators will be offered the vaccines? Um, educators fit into. Um, 1B within that tiering system. Um, the and just to go through the 1A, 1B, and 1C. 1A, as we said, are the healthcare workers um, and residents of long-term cares, uh, long-term care facilities. 1B are people who have uh, quote what are known as essential jobs, and in most of those schemes, um, educators are put into that that grouping. So when do we see that? Um, I'm would my crystal ball will say that's probably um, two months from now um, would be you know and it, it'll start before that um, but it again with all the caveats we get enough vaccine um, but it's and that we have the systems we have the systems I think it's more getting enough vaccine and then trying to figure out how do we make sure that those people in those essential services which include you know our all of our um, firemen and uh, um, a variety of others who um, we depend upon for our society as well as our educators get into the, get in um, to the queue. One C is going to be those individuals with high risk conditions and those over 65 years. Um, and I'm guessing that's going to be two and a half to three months. Great. Thanks. Dr. Sears, just a clarification. So the length of efficacy of the vaccine, uh, would you mind repeating that for one of our audience members? Sure. Um, we really don't know at this point. Mm -hmm. um, we know that um, the vaccine, there's, there's two pieces of, of evidence we have. The first is from what are known as the, the uh, big clinical trials that were, that, you know, 30, 40,000 people were in. Those are the, that's the data we have that shows that it works and it shows that it's safe. Um, that, those individuals have only mm -hmm. been followed out about two months. But if we look back and say, 
um, the people who had this vaccine in what were called phase one and two of the trials, those people still seem to have um, what looks like reasonable immunity. It's not enough people right now to say, oh, we know that this is gonna last 10, 12 or 14 months. Um, we're hoping, um, but that's one of the things we're gonna have to follow very closely in this. Hmm. So w we are running short of time. So instead of asking questions, I'm gonna put just a couple of things out there. Um, we do recognize that there's side effects from the vaccine. Uh, they range from uh, muscle aches and pains to low grade fever. Uh, some of them actually overlap the symptoms of getting the, getting the virus in the initial stages, which makes it hard to clear people to go back to work. Hence, one of the things we're doing at Northern Light Health is trying to schedule the vaccination. I think Dr. Gass uh, suggested that's how she made her decision, uh, where you have actually time off the day after. Uh, it seems like the side effects may be more prominent in the, with the second dose versus the first dose, and it's critical to get the second dose uh, for the Pfizer, 21 days, Moderna, 28 days. Uh, Dr. Sears, did I get those two dates correct? You did. Okay, great. Um, and then I'm going to just uh, ask you for uh, just a quick blurb, Dr. Sears, on um, some treatment. So talk about the monoclonal antibodies for a moment. Sure, monoclonal antibodies. Well, let's back up and just see what are antibodies. Antibodies are uh, proteins that our body develops to fight off infections. What are monoclonal antibodies? Those are developed antibodies um, in the laboratory and manufacturing sphere. They are specifically directed to be against the COVID or what's known as the SARS-CoV-2 virus, what causes COVID. It binds onto those little spikes that you've, if you're, everybody's always seen picture this of the virus. It looks kind of like a, a mine that's at sea with those spikes coming out. It binds onto that. And when it binds those spikes, it prevents the virus from going into our cells. Um, I would say that these are very useful, but they are not curative. Where we use them is we use them in people very early on in the disease to try to prevent deterioration and to try to prevent somebody needing to be hospitalized. The biggest problem with them now is they just aren't enough to go around. Um, and that's because they're much harder drugs to produce than say penicillin or um, something that is not uh, much, much more biologically oriented. Um, they are one more tool in our toolbox in treating. I think early on in this, the course of this, we talked about that treatment's getting much better, that we are able to care for people better. This is a, a step forward in giving people something that might prevent them from deteriorating and getting sicker. We need more drugs like that. We need more therapies. Um, they're coming, but they're, you know, they're coming almost at the same time as the vaccine, and using them together will probably be very, very effective in the long run. One caveat is we know that if you've gotten that drug, you should not get the vaccine for 90 days. Mm, okay, thank you. And then I'm going to make a comment, uh, Dr. Gass, uh, just to affirm if I got this right. Uh, remdesivir is used in... Um, moderate to severe disease in hospitalized patients. Is that correct? Um, yes, it's only available and its only utility is in hospitalized patients okay, who have great. oxygen so, requirements. So I think that's important for everyone to understand. Um, unfortunately, we need another hour to talk about treatments and all sorts of great things, but we're at the end of our time here. So I'll ask each of our doctors for uh, 30 seconds. Um, to tell us, what do you want to make sure our audience hears loud and clear? 30 seconds, please. Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Jarvis. Uh, the vaccine is coming, but it is not the answer to everything. Um, we need to continue to be vigilant and practice good practices. You heard us say it before. I'm going to say it again. Wear your mask, wash your hands, stay away from others. Perfect. Dr. Gass. Wear your mask, wash your hands, <laughs> watch your distance and take care of each other. Go out into the world as if you want to protect the person who's nearest and dearest to your heart. And for our audience, we didn't prepare these answers to be in sync like this. Dr. Sears. Uh, I could just say ditto, but yeah, uh, I, which, I, which, which I probably will at some, at, you know, if you give me enough um, time. But I think that 
I would emphasize that we have learned a tremendous amount. We are still learning. Um, we'll probably learn more. And, and what I always tell everybody when I'm talking about this is what I say today may well be improved and we'll know more next week or the week after. Um, but the one thing we do know is that if you wear a mask, you wash your hands and you keep distance from people, that prevents the transmission. And if we prevent the transmission, then we won't need to worry about all those therapies um, and all the other um, you know, breakthroughs that we've had. Um, and the vaccine, when it comes along, is just another tool. It's part of taking care of this disease overall. And then my final is emphasizing Dr. Gass. This, we need to take care of ourselves during this. This has been a very, very challenging time. This is 10 months now or more. And uh, we're just still um, finding out all of how it has affected folks. So take a moment both for yourselves and then for your friends. Um, and we will get through this. I mean, that's the, I think, I really think we'll get through this. Well, thank you, Dr. Sears. And so Dr. Gilkey weighing in on that regarding the mask, the distancing, and the hand washing is ditto. So having said that, I'll kind of cut my 30 seconds down and thank all of our speakers today. It was wonderful having you all. Thanks for taking the time out of very, very busy schedules to do this uh, with us in our audience. And thanks, uh, thanks to our audience and have happy holidays to you. Our next session will be on January 7th with timely updates after the holidays. The topics include COVID-19 updates, vaccine updates, and support of your workforce. Uh, we will send you the link for this session. We encourage you to share the invitation with your friends, colleagues, and others who might benefit from this information. And don't forget to fill out the uh, survey uh, at the end of this to give us that useful information. By working together, we will keep Maine safe. Thank you and have a safe holiday season.